On this week in sales, we're going to be looking at if insurance salespeople are now obsolete, why sales practice might make perfect, if you should get paid daily rather than monthly, and much, much more. Hi, my name is Will Barron, and I'm one half of this week in sales, the other half, the legend that is. Victor Antonio joins me by the power of the internet. Victor, how is it going, sir? Will Barrett, I am doing good, and it's always great to see you, my friend. Always great to see you. By the way, a, can I say something, Will? So I, I want to make this public, if I can. I like working with Will. I really <laughs> like working with this guy. He's cool to work with, so I like working with you. Go ahead. I, I just well, wanted, I wanted that documented publicly, man. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to document anything, uh, Victor, and uh, we'll, we'll leave <laughs> it there, okay. mate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> right. Well, let's jump into this, because there's actually... A ton of news this week. There's always a ton of news, but there's a ton of interesting news that we don't have to put a spin on. Is it's interesting in its own right? And I want to get your thoughts on this one. So this is a post, post a, a post even from the Cointelegraph.com. Your car insurance salesperson is now an AI bot connected to the blockchain. We'll ignore the blockchain part of this for the second. We can come back to that maybe later on. But a Malta-based virtual assistant from Veot, I think I'm pronouncing that right, has integrated IBM's Watson Assistant with the Cosmos blockchain to sell car insurance. This new platform, Victor, features an end-to-end -end sales process that does not require any human assistance to complete the car insurance contract. So you're not just getting a quote, this is a complete contract. So let me ask you this, Victor. There's more. There's more points here we can go through. But is that scary for salespeople? It should be scary for salespeople, but it's the it's the trend. I mean, it, it'll be it'll get to the point. Look at Carvana, right? You get, it's like like a slot machine or a vending machine. You just buy your car. I mean, most people are actually buying cars online now. Like it's no big deal. So why wouldn't they buy insurance without? I mean, the bot can actually analyze all these different quotes for them. I can only imagine you go click, 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 check out all these. Find the best one, give it to me, boom. And hopefully the, the cognitive AI doesn't have any bias in it. Know what I mean? And so this is normal. If you're a salesperson, bye-bye. So there's another layer to this, Victor, as well. Uh -oh. So Drama. the mobile app interacts with customers via voice or text, initially asking a series of questions to identify and suggest insurance options. Clearly, mm -hmm. they're just trying to take some of the burden off the customer so they don't fill in a form because I imagine 50% of forms don't get completed. So that's why they're trying to do it, as opposed to probably adding like layers of value or a consultative selling approach. But that I thought was novel to all of this of, sure, you can go online, fill out some forms and get some quotes and, and go through this versus this versus this. But to actually have that engagement, I've no idea how good the engagement is, mm -hmm. but to have that voiced and text AI engagement that's trying to appear to be real, I thought that was really novel. That is interesting, right? Because if uh... Like I've seen what auto trader is doing and you still have to go to auto trader and click, 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 click. Mm -hmm. But if a bot's actually engaging with you in a conversation and taking that text, that conversation and putting it in, almost like what we talked about in the last week, right? We talked about the CRM putting data conversation into a CRM maybe two weeks ago. So that is interesting, Will. That's a good find, man. That's, a, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and, and companies like Drift.com, um, Disclosure, are the, the sponsor in the podcast at the moment, the Salesman Podcast, but they do this very uh, well as well. And there's, there's other technologies out there that can do it. So I'd be interested to understand better with this organization if they've built something new or if they're using a, an organization like Drift that already has all of this implemented. But I feel like this is interesting for salespeople because it might be in the future that rather than, I don't know, someone down, B2B sales, someone downloads a white paper from your organization, and then you are tasked with this really awkward phone call to follow up, and they probably don't really want to speak with you, but you ring up and you're trying to judge if they're interested in what you've got to offer. Um, a lot of that perhaps could be automated by a quick call, and you go back and forth, and then the salesperson could be left then just selling and, and closing real opportunities as opposed to, I guess, salespeople probably waste a lot of time on, on opportunities that marketing think are qualified and, and everyone in the sales world know mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. May, you know, one of the things, as you're saying that, I'm going, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But maybe, here's the role for the salesperson. I'm going to keep glass half full right now because <laughs> you're, you're going negative on me. And so I'm going to keep it half full for the people. Okay, for that part of the process, I say the salesperson's out, right? Eventually, the salesperson's out. But, but Will, could it be that once these folks buy into the car insurance, there's an upsell opportunity that definitely requires human intervention? And maybe that's where the salesperson drifts too see how i tied those two together drifts <laughs> you see how i did that so 
the, the king of puns. So, do you know what? Puns are something that I am really rubbish at. So when I'm writing <laughs> scripts for the YouTube content, I'll write a whole script. I can, I, I've read a few books on writing jokes and I did have aspirations this year to do, it'd be terrible, but just as almost a, a way to just thrash my own ego, I wanted to do a stand-up comedy, just a, a, a open mic night. So you know, write like two or three minutes and, and give that a go. Obviously with COVID, that's not happening. That was one of my, one of my goals for the year. But yeah, the uh, the I've totally lost my train of thought now because uh, oh yeah, with puns, I can <laughs> I can write somewhat complex jokes. Whether they're funny or not is is uh, up to the 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 person kind of viewing and watching them. But puns, I just find really difficult for whatever reason. My, my brain isn't wired to to pull those two um, words together. Uh, it could be a British thing. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the the know. the kings of comedy? The kings. Oh, nicely done. See that? That oh, was a good one. See, that, that, that was a good one, man. That was a good <laughs> I did not even mean to do that. Uh, Maybe yeah. I've got it. Maybe I'm overthinking you're, you're over, it. Like, we'll you're, leave it you're overthinking the pro- <laughs> overthinking the process. <laughs> oh. I love that. I love that. <laughs> okay, Victor, what, have, right. we got, what have we got next, mate? Wait, hey, you were going to tie this. Are you going to tie this into Bitcoin or not? Because that, that's no, the part so, I'm curious about. Uh, so that's- from what I understand about the product, the the data that is pulled from individuals is for some reason pushed into a uh, not necessarily a Bitcoin but a what do you call it a, a blockchain type of technology. For anyone who isn't, and I'm not overly familiar, maybe you can fill in some gaps here, Victor. Mm. But as far as I'm aware, blockchain is a way to store data in that when things are added to the end of it, the blockchain continues, so you can suss out where things have come from and you can go back in time and, and historically. Uh, track things and, and it's very difficult to break the blockchain uh, with the algorithms and and security that's based on top of it which is you know, why bitcoin gets uh, when new coins are mined they're added to the end of that blockchain which devalues the rest of it slightly uh, but they become more and more difficult to mine over time as the algorithm gets harder and harder to solve so in answer to your question you can tell me if i'm wrong with any of that in a second but uh in answer to your question i think they're just sticking some kind of blockchain in there just because it's the the buzzword of the moment yeah, I mean, I don't really understand blockchains. I tried to kind of understand it. It still makes no sense to me. I just <laughs> think of it as a virtual ledger yep, that people yep. use to validate information to make sure it's correct. And maybe that's how they're using it. It's just like a virtual ledger that can validate rates and things of that nature. So that's as far as I want to go. But, Will, tying on to this whole, what are we going to do with these salespeople and tying into these bots having conversation, x.ai. I love this app. I've used this app. And basically, I'll just read you a little bit. X-Day Out, the leading meeting scheduling tool for individuals and teams, today announced a major update to their AI scheduling technology that lets their users request a meeting over email or Slack in any language. They're doing like 55 languages. Now, X.AI, it's, it's actually a plugin you can even do with Google Mail. And what it does, if I want to schedule a meeting with you, instead of going with the back and forth, I just CC some fictitious person with a dot .xi, x.ai, you know, like Bill, sure. my secretary at x.ai. And then Bill takes over the conversation with you. So I send you, hey, well, I'd like to get together with you next week. Are you available? And I cc bill.xai. And then Bill takes over the conversation. And so you're going to be talking to Bill and then until you finally reach an understanding or agree on a date. And then Bill puts it into my calendar. So now you're doing that in space. And Bill can understand, you know, your responses using natural language pro- processing. Amazing. How, again, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm being slightly pes- I think So I think we could discuss this the other week. I'm not being pessimist. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate to what you're saying. So if you said something negative, I'd say something positive. By the just way, I think it comes, very natural, it comes very natural to you to play devil's advocate. I've learned that. Go ahead. It does. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It might wind <laughs> my uh, girlfriend up uh, because everything she says, like, well, yeah, well, well, think about the have empathy on the other side of the, 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 the tale here. Um, but in a world where Basically, everyone is using Gmail, G Calendar, and in businesses, Google um, kind of uh, apps on the back end of things. Can this not just be automated further of there's just a link in Gmail somewhere it says show this particular day of calendar and allow someone to book it? Because I, I use calendarly.com, which allows mm-hmm. people to book a slot in my calendar. Um, I guess what I'm asking here is when is AI useful and when uh, and, and uh, when it's artificially being a person and when is it overkill is it easier just to send a link to my calendar to book a day or is the value in going back and forth over with ai via email to to get the same job done 
Well, it's interesting because, you know, historically, I'm giving you my history of this. I found X.AI first, and then I found Calendly, which is what you use and I use. And I found Calendly to be straightforward. Just send somebody the link, they pick the date, we're good. There's no back and forth. This one, I think, is going to have to fight hard to find its place in the market. But now that it's multi-language, maybe that's kind of the differentiator to say, hey, how do we do this when we're communicating internationally with somebody else? Yeah, well, you I mean, know, if you can't speak Spanish, you're not going to book a meeting with someone in Spanish who only speaks Spanish, are you? But if I type it in English, it can translate into Spanish and you get yep. the invitation in Spanish. So it'll say, you know, hey, Will, can we meet next week? Translation. Yeah, but if Weird. they don't speak English and they're only going to speak Spanish on the call, you, does that make sense? Yeah. The, the, in other words, booking the thing isn't people, the issue. The, just the fact that you are not, can't communicate with I'm, them in general. Yeah, you, you have a good point there, and there might be some <laughs> applications you and I are not aware of. But <laughs> I, I think, think it's cool. cool. I think it's really think cool. It, but you know, again, well, I think what we're seeing is all these companies are coming up with their little piece of the technology pie, the AI pie. And it's just going to be interesting over the next few years just to wait, see how this all shakes out. So sure. I think this is a company who's trying to differentiate themselves. Don't be surprised if X.AI gets bought out by Google or Salesforce or somebody because they figured out maybe even, it's not so much the translation, but being able to kind of pull out the sentiment analysis out of the different languages because that in itself is quite the science. You can say something in English, then say it in Spanish, two different meanings, one positive, one negative. So that might be some of the secret sauce behind this. I'm giving sure. them the benefit of the doubt. Sure. See? And as, as I say this, Victor, to play devil's advocate on myself, maybe this could be useful. I automate this with email, but maybe it could be useful of you book a meeting and then the AI goes, hey, before you meeting, you might want to check out this, this, and this. Oh, have you checked that out yet? Oh, if you're not, here's an alternative or here's a shorter mm -hmm. video or a longer video. So maybe beyond just that initial booking in a calendar, which is a somewhat straightforward process, Maybe there's more use for uh, that kind of technology on the back things to build agendas or anything else that could be automated when uh, one side of the conversation is doing lots of these meetings and perhaps the other person isn't as used to doing the meetings as, as what the uh, kind of meeting originator is. Yeah, I would love, I lo I would love to be part of AX.AI, you know, kind of see what's behind the curtain to see how they're really generating revenue and who's buying this technology. Because, you know, on top of that, and we'll end it on this, on top of that, there might be, like, for example, Calendly may not be as secure with their data, and then maybe the X.AI is a more secure form of sending and inviting people. Maybe that's it. So, interesting. But your point is well taken. Good challenge. Good challenge. I love that. I, I appreciate it, Victor. Well, I, we need yeah. probably like a, a strike rule because there's probably, I probably challenge things like in tennis where you can challenge the judge. Uh, yeah. When the ball's on the lineup, because I probably yeah. get more of these wrong than I do right. Right. Be like, Next be like up. Macaro. Did you yeah. see that? <laughs> so I'll just start hurling tennis rackets at you, Victor, across the internet. Right. One day Next be a up. Next up, this came in uh, from a tip from uh, if you go to thisweekinsales.com, there's a form there. If there's anything you want us to cover, anything new, exciting, news, press releases, just drop uh, a message in there and it'll be sent over to, uh, to me and I'll add it to the doc that we run this show from. So I had a tip and Mind Tickle. We talked about them, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we talked about this uh, kind of new sales learning and, and development platforms that's a growth area as well. Mindtickle has raised $100 million in venture funding. Mindtickle helps large and small businesses through its sales readiness platform. And the name, who's in, uh, or the name was inspired from the idea of gamifying mindsets. It allows companies to train and upskill their salespeople at scale using role playing and, and helps them practice their pitch. And again, mm -hmm. uses gamification to do this rather than, I'm sure you've been there, Victor, both in your, your sales and your management days of the really awkwardness of sitting opposite someone and, and role playing your, your sales situations, which I think works extremely well, but most salespeople hate doing it, don't they? Mm -hmm. This is interesting because, you know, uh, there's something else we're going to cover here that has to do with training as well. And, and I'm wondering, well, just talking out loud here, how do you get that realism tied into your, you know, into the actual software for the role playing. I think that's, that's the hat trick, isn't it? Because it's how do you get that realism in there? That's tough. I think that's going to be very difficult to do. And so, but somebody apparently, several people have decided to spend a hundred million dollars, apparently believing that mind tickle can tickle people's minds in a right way. So <laughs> there's people out there who know more than we do, man. Sure. So, so it's interesting. So we, 
we over at salesman.org, we try and do a, and it's, it's basic, it's implementation of this because clearly we <laughs> don't have hundreds of millions being thrown at us in, in venture funding, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a scenario-based system. So depending on the training that you've done, it will say, rather than just test you of, is the answer A or B? It will put you in a situation of the salesperson has said one, two, three. Should you reply with X or Y? So that's a, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to, criticize myself slightly i'd say that's a unsophisticated way of doing it because the situations that you're in are thought up by me and the team as opposed to real life situations mm -hmm. that you might find yourself in as a salesperson within a specific organization so i think mind tickle i don't think I'm, I'm just looking on the website now i don't think they provide content i think they only provide a platform for individuals within probably the enterprise who are coached and, and skilled in things like oh. learning design to create content and their platform then hosts it, which in which case you can Love quiz it. a salespeople uh, and, um, you know, find out scenarios that they do well in scenarios that they do bad in. Maybe you're, you're a fan of gong or chorus or whoever, and you mm -hmm. can pull data from there of on a sales call. We fail 80% mm. of the time when this thing comes up so you can implement a scenario in a similar way that what we do, but more, uh, again, sophisticated and, and more targeted to your own organization, your own products. So I think that's that the, the system that they're using to do this. That totally makes sense because it's almost like creating a platform and then just selling subscriptions to the platform, whatever it may be, yep. or access to the platform. So I like that. And you're right. You know, the, the what you're talking about is, is kind of a decision tree type of, would you do A, B, C? And that's okay. But, you know, but even to get that content in for a specific company, for a specific industry, and for a specific product, selling to a specific client, it's just too specific. And so, but this platform would allow a company to go deep and narrow into that and do it correctly. So, all right, I, I, I'm in the mind tickle right now. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm feeling mind tickle right now. $100 million. I knew there were smarter people than us making decisions, man. <laughs> That's Speaking so of money. <laughs> hey, let me add to this, Victor, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 I just mentioned you know, the, the product that we have. You have a, a training product as well, um, you know, and all the content you produce, the podcast, the incredible YouTube content, the, the live content. If someone came along and was like, Victor, I want to invest into Victor Enterprises. Here's a hundred million dollars. What would you do with it? You can't take what it to yourself. I... There's no direct loans. It's got to be into <sighs> the business for for growth. I think I would go with what MindTickle is doing, like create a platform that everybody can use. Isn't that the game? I mean, you know, and and maybe a sub, you know subscription model. I mean, that's what I would do with it. I, I'm saying I like MindTickle. I like their <laughs> their ideas better than anything I had because uh, you think of here would be the challenge though. There's so many learning management platforms out there like Thinkific comes to mind, uh, Lightspeed VT, Kajabi. These are, they're all out there. You probably have a couple more you want to mention, but there's so many of these platforms. The question then becomes, are LMS, learning management systems, becoming commoditized? Yep. You know, and I think that, by the way, will AI be infused into these learning management systems as you just pointed out? Because I think that's important. I, I want to go back to, you know, this is, I always go back to this. My brain runs back to Wired Magazine. I forgot his last name. I think it's Kevin Kelly, who was one of the originators of Wired Magazine, who said, when you think of AI, think of it as utility, like electricity. We're going to put it through everything. And that, but you're not going to see the AI. You're going to see the, the product itself. Just like you don't see electricity, you see the light. And I look at that learning management infused with AI, and that's how I see it. So I think it's brilliant. But again, is it getting commoditized? Will AI in the future be commoditized? I think so. I'll give you um, a couple of, I guess, examples. So the <clears> first <throat> post that was from, the, the, the first article we talked about from Cointelegraph, they're using IBM Watson. And there's only a few handful of super AIs that all have APIs that you can, you can build on top of. So that's the value that you can add to, to your service. But just in itself, when newsworthy sales technology companies are, well, I guess they're almost anti-sales, wiping out insurance salespeople, whatever we want to kind of brand it as. But when technology companies are kind of using two or three systems of AI, Salesforce, mm -hmm. Amazon, um, Watson by IBM, it's almost a commodity already. Interesting. I like that phrase. I've never heard anybody use that phrase, a uh, super AI. <laughs> I like that phrase. No, you because it, 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 it describes the behemoths, right? The Leviathans, mm -hmm. the big companies. They're just like, they're super AI. I love that phrase. But you're right. If everybody's going on their platform, are you, are you going to go on the, uh, I guess, almost like the PC Mac thing, right? Are you yep. going to go on Watson? Are you going to go on Salesforce? What are you going to do? You know, so you may be right that the platforms or the operating systems uh, is what becomes commoditized. 
But go back to, you know, mind tickle is that maybe they're creating their super AI, you know, LMS platform, and maybe that's the angle they're going for in the long run. If they're sure. not, they should listen to us <laughs> and then put us on their board of directors and cut us in on a couple of shares. That's what I'm thinking, Will. I, I, I think I think we're talking about it <laughs> offline. I think that's what we should be doing. We should be, we, we, we need to make a highlight of all the stuff we get wrong. We'll cut all the stuff we get right. Uh, we'll, we'll make a highlight reel of all the stuff we get right, cut the things that we get wrong, and then start sending it around and see if we can get some board seats going on the yeah. show. Well, I see a lot of people do that. I see uh, one of my favorites, and, and by the way, I, I want to preface this with I love the guy. I love the guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, there's a lot of wrong predictions. But he always highlights the ones he's got right. I love that about him. I'm like, hey, you got a couple of things wrong. But he's still, like I said, I, I love the guy. I think he's he was ahead of his time when it came to social media and really getting online. But we digress. Can I talk about Proposify? Pros, yeah, Proposify. I think it's called uh, Prosify. I can't say this thing. I kept like practicing it. Proposify. Pro, Prospify. I think it's Propos pro Prosify. Pro Proposify. This is this is cutting edge it's, content it's, here, Victor. By the way, the yeah, it is. <laughs> by the way, it's P R O P O S I F Y. <laughs> Proposify. I think it's Proposify. What do you? I found this one. I thought it was interesting because we never talk about that part of the sales process. You know, the the, the proposal phase and how that's being managed. And what I like about this software is that, and I highlight something. Here, if you're a manager, you want to know what stage is your deal in. And then if you're a salesperson, uh, you know, you don't have to build something from scratch. That's where a lot of time is lost. I like it from a marketing standpoint because they can control what content's in the library. We talked about content management systems to actually control what goes into the proposals. And then obviously, uh, Proposify allows you to track your, you know, did somebody actually look at the proposal? Did you win or lose it? That's some basic stuff. But I, but I think this is interesting because I start fast forwarding. If I start capturing all this content of all these different proposals and I start building this knowledge base of, let's say, 100, 200, 500 proposals with win-loss ratios here and there, I can actually use some AI algorithm to go back and actually analyze to see where we win, where we lose. And I, and I got that concept from, I thought it was interesting, I got that from Salesforce, their Einstein system. You can adjust the price and the probability of winning or losing actually moves the needle. I, it's, a, it's a great, you know, I don't know it's a great tool. What do you think, Will? I think I think the Einstein uh, angle you just mentioned there <clears> is insane. <throat> I think that is the future of all of this. I feel like it's, I don't feel like it. there's tons of data that show there'll be some kind of dashboard and pricing will be specific to individuals. And this will be a way to differentiate, right? It, you, and I'm not talking about buying your McDonald's sandwich, uh, your burger. I don't think that will fluctuate as you walk in the store, depending on who's buying mm -hmm. it. But everything else probably will. You're buying a car. Well, we know that you bought three BMWs. We know that you service with us. We've got all this data on the back end of your family. Your kids uh, is probably, you know, 17, just about to turn 18, can just get the driver's license. And so we'll give you a deal now, knowing that our marketing is going to be so specific to you in BMW or BMW Mini that you're going to buy from us in the future. I think all of that, it's, it's difficult to communicate that. And that'll be something that salespeople will have to learn how to do. Because I just threw a load of stuff, and if you said that to a potential customer, mm -hmm. they'd be like, "Just tell me the price. Is, is it yeah. a good deal? I've no idea." But it also, having said that, it allows you then to take price and stop it being uh, something that's competed on. Because you could say, "Well, we can give you this, but we can't give you that. We can give you this," and your competitors don't know why you're pricing one thing one way. You don't, and they, they can't compete with mm -hmm. you on that front because, again, they don't have all the data. Uh, you know, if you're leading this space, they don't have the data that you have to make these educated judgments. So they might be undercutting you on price and not getting any of the additional revenue that you would have got. And so you end up putting them out of business by them just making bad decisions as opposed to you uh, kind of failing at anything. It, it would be interesting to, f to find out, every company is going to have a different number, but it would be interesting to find out for every company that uses AI with some of these applications and programs, like how many variables or data points are in flux for you to make a specific decision. And I remember, and I'm trying to remember the company I was, I was looking at, they said, we look at 250 variables before pulling the trigger on an actual you know, pr uh, strategy. <clears throat> and I thought, 250 variables, changing all like an equalizer at one time, amazing, amazing. The technology is amazing, but anyway, I like this proposal five because it's like, we never talk about that part of the sales process, 
And I think this one's important because when the deals are won, when the deals are lost, feed that back into the CRM, help us make more better, make better decisions. For sure. At what point, Victor, does this become a burden for salespeople when you know that you can get the deal done at this price because you're a human and you're speaking to humans, but the computer mm -hmm. goes, no, we can only provide you with this, this pricing right now. And then you've got to go to your sales manager and they've got to go up the food chain. And then you've got to, the, the algorithm can't, uh, can't look into the future. Well, obviously it can look into the future, probably better than, more accurate than a human can, right. but you know something that the algorithm doesn't. And so it right. becomes a massive faff every time you've got to kind of debate and we'll talk about negotiation in a second, but uh, when you're trying to negotiate all this, at, at which point does, it, does this become a bit of a bird? I, you know, I don't know. I, I go back to the conversation we were having last week when I was watching the documentary of Deep Mind, you know, or, you know it, it, and the whole thing about the documentary about, you know, the, the machines playing Go and somewhere in the, in the fourth game, it, it creates a God move, they call it. And the God move was something that wasn't in the program. And even everybody's watching is going, where the hell did the machine come with that? And the machine won the game. So then that's a case when the machine knew what you didn't know. So the question really becomes one of trust. How much do you trust your algorithm? I leave it at that. Nice. How much do you trust your algorithm? Because that's subjective, isn't it? You, you yes. trust it as long as it wins. Right. And I, and I think that's what, I, you know, I, I've heard that phrase before. It's how much do you trust your algorithm? If you trust it, then you're good. Because maybe... The, the algorithms calculate, yeah, you could win the deal at that price, but here's a ripple effect of what's going to happen in the background that you're not thinking about. So that might be another perspective. So do you trust your algorithm? We're going, going deep here, Victor, because at yeah, some point, the algorithm's going to go, you're a bit tired today, it. Will. You should just go home and have a chill. Let, <laughs> let me take over. I'll just take 10% <laughs> of your commission and buy some new uh, power supplies and expand my uh, reach in the office. I think we should pull out of this conversation. Let's pull out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next up. And I found this is a genuinely interesting article. I'll link to it in the show notes to this episode. It's from like knowledge.inseed.edu. Uh, Inseed in must be an acronym for something. Um, but I'll link to it in the show notes if you want to check it out. So hold the emoji and other tips for successful email negotiations. So according what? to- What? I was shocked. I know where you're going with this because I've read okay. the notes, but I'm like, this was good, Will. This is a good find because you shifted my paradigm a bit. But go ahead. I'm just, I just want to set the audience up to pay attention. Lean forward in a world nice. of emojis. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> go ahead. According to 2019 research that was recently published by, a, uh, by IACCM, a global contract management association, about 75% of contract negotiations are completely virtual. So nowadays, many B two B negotiations. Uh, sorry, that's a big number, man. I mean, think about that. I mean, I, I want you to pause on that because seventy five percent of contract negotiations are completely virtual. Wow, I didn't think it was that high. I thought maybe fifty, forty, but not that high. That's big. Well, I've not since running uh, Salesman.org set, set up kind of five and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. I've done one deal in person, and that was a trip over to San Francisco. Um. I've, I've, everything I've done has been, has been virtual. It, most of it has been done over email and a few phone calls. This is uh, training mm -hmm. contracts. This is sponsorship contracts, uh, partnerships with the brand and, and, and associated mm. things on that. It's contracts with um, our, our team that all work remotely as well. I've never met any of the team that work over at Salesman.org. So hi, team, mm. everyone who's probably tuning into this and editing it as we go through in uh, real time. But yeah. That doesn't surprise me at all. And, and it's okay. actually interesting to me that it surprises you, Victor. Well, the thing is, okay, so first of all, this was done in 2019, pre-pandemic, right? That's one. Uh, and it says many B2B organizations. That, I think that's the part that, that caught me off guard, you know, because um, I'm thinking maybe my brain went to complex sales. And I said, nobody negotiates complex sales, you know, virtually. We're going to get out, we're in a room, we're going to hash this out, you know, figure timelines out. So that's why it surprises me. So I'm surprised that you're surprised that I'm surprised. <laughs> so, but, but let's let's put it into context. Let's try and put that into context slightly then. So 75%, so that leaves 25%. So if we say this is just, I don't know this for a fact. Let's say this is just B2B sales, right? What percentage of B2B sales are large, complex enterprise sales that need to be in person? It's probably only 10% of those sales, right? I, I don't imagine that most sales that happen via the, the B2B mechanism from one organization to another, I don't imagine that the majority of them are complex. I will not challenge that notion. I believe you to be correct. 
So I, like I said, I guess maybe I didn't. Th- I haven't thought about that, but I just. I, it's a shocking number when you see it. I guess maybe that's. Mm. I just wasn't expecting that number. I, I like your 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 guesstimate of the ten percent. I was going to say five percent. So I think sure. yeah, I think yeah. And, and I'm Continue. slightly biased on this. You might be as well in that my background in sales is extremely complex business to government uh, sales where a surgeon physically has to use your product inside a patient. You can't really do that over Zoom. Yeah. Like I said, bottom line, if 75% of contract negotiations are completely virtual, and by the way, they, did they define virtual? Like, is it just via email? Because that's virtual. Or is it video also or all the above? All of the above. Basically, it's just not in person, shaking hands and going for meals and, and greasing people's palms. Right. And, and this really, this really, I mean, I guess this again puts another finer point on virtual is here to stay. This is not something that just happened to us. It's been here. For sure. I agree. Uh, it's the way the world's going. As millennials age up into, we talked about last week, as millennials age up into buying roles, uh, I myself am a millennial. I don't want someone coming over and, and pestering me. I want to get on the phone. I want to get deals done. And nine times out of 10, unless it's a physical product, I mm. feel anyway that you can you can get a lot of this done and the data shows that up. So the data actually was really interesting from this article. Again, I'll, I'll look in the show notes to this episode. And it shows that now many B2B sales negotiations involved an open bid process with standardized communication where relationship bonds are less important. And I think there's data on this as well that shows buyers care less about relationships than they do uh, standardized processes and, and maybe procurement is becoming more ubiquitous as well in the uh, larger enterprise sale. And so in that context, this article says that emails offer an advantage over in-person or even phone conversations. So they list an, a number of uh, reasons why the email uh, negotiating over an email might be beneficial. So there's less reliance on relationships. So if you're trying to get into an account that you don't have any relationships with, clearly this is beneficial for you. There's more transparency. Emails can get shared. There's issues potentially with data going back and forth where it shouldn't go back and forth, but that's relatively easily solved. And I thought this is really important and interesting. They mentioned, they mentioned this a number of times in the article. There is less discrimination they found when they've studied this in negotiations done by email. So they can't see how old you are. You're, they, they can guess at your sex, I guess, because you, you know whether you're talking to a man or a woman. By the way, I, I got to confess here. I got to confess. I discriminate via email. I really do. I'm gonna be very. Sp- I'm gonna be very specific about my discrimination. Uh, please be it, specific it, here before. Yeah. Like, yeah. Before they shut something. us down. <laughs> this. This. This is a. Uh, if you send me an email, and it has at Gmail, at Yahoo, at Hotmail, you will be automatically discriminated against by me. That's what I'm saying. That's where my discrimination comes in. I shouldn't say discrimination. Maybe the mo- more appropriate word is discernment. That's what I would use. I would discern it different. You know what I mean? Because I'm mm-hmm. like, why don't you have a real website? That's yeah. my point. I've seen people send me stuff and they put blah, blah, blah at Gmail. I'm like, why would you do that? Why not use a company if you are a company? Yep. So joking I, aside, I see that. I, I was discount those. Yep. It goes further than that. Then you click on the website and if it's some crappy website, there's been no effort in it. There's no content on there. There's no, I hate the word, but you know, thought leadership. There's no reason why I want to reply because I've, I've actually had, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but I've definitely had this happen to me before. Someone will email me saying, hey, we offered this service. And I'll go, oh, wow, that, that would actually be a pretty good service to be involved with. And then I'll just Google the best company to to do to work with so people are doing a lot of the legwork of selling of of implementing it's like inceptioning that thought into to my brain on different projects different things um changing paradigms business wise of what's possible mm-hmm. but then they've not got the content the thought leadership and everything else to back it up yeah i love that and by the way the inceptioning of the idea was very cleverly thrown in there <laughs> this is this is interesting because it talks about because, you know, well, I don't know if it's just me, but when I hear people say, you know, sales is all about relationships. And I'm like, you know, I think a relationship is a result of a good transaction. It's, it's you put it after the deal, not before the deal. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to have good rapport with the potential client or the prospect. I am saying that most people want a relationship after we've signed some deal, we've gotten married on a contract. Let's do this. So I love what says less reliance on relationships. Love that. More transparency. It's all in the email and less discrimination. You don't know who's sending it. So I, I love this one. This is a good one. I think I think I, I want to double down on this point of relationships, Victor. We, we have a uh, I don't know, is it a metaphor or an anecdote or a, 
whatever it is. You can tell me. I always get them mm. confused. If Barry, my mate, who you know is sitting sits opposite me in the offices, uh, you know, get on with him really well, got a good relationship. If he says, "Hey, well, I, I, I want to do some sales training for your team," I've got a good relationship, but I've got no, there's no value that potentially that you can. I don't feel like there's potential value that you can offer me. Victor Antonio rings me up, and I'm going. Freaking hell, is that actually Victor Antonio? This is sick. I'm super excited. I don't I don't have a relationship with you other than a one-way one of consuming your content, reading your books, understanding that you're a legend in this space. But I'm going to immediately just accept a coffee with you to, to discuss things or a or phone call to see where the opportunities are. And that just shows, in my mind, again, I don't know if it's a metaphor, anecdote, whatever it is, that a relationship is not as valuable as being known and being the best in the space. I love that. You know, the... The book, The Challenger Sale, really brought that home back in December of 2011. I remember that because I really love that book. And when it talked about that the relationship seller obviously did the worst when it came to a complex sale and a bad economy, that, you know, I remember a lot of people screaming at the book, what do you mean? The relationship, you know, because it, it was hard for people to accept, but I think people are coming around to our way of thinking, Will, because we were the leaders in this space. <laughs> <laughs> the the leader of biggest egos on YouTube yeah, yeah. slash Just iTunes. <laughs> on this week in sales. All right. Hey, check this out. Perfect practice makes perfect. How original. Uptick, that's the company. Uptick or the product. Uptick enables reps to practice real life customer interactions they face. Like playing a video game, reps work their way through challenging scenarios and receive consistent expert feedback from Uptick's virtual coach. Now, this is a simulator by Sciotics, Sci I'm sorry, Sciolytics. And Sciolytics, it's, I looked at it, and I, because I came across it, I said, this is really interesting. And it has a lot of, uh, you know, if you're into, uh, was it uh, Final Fantasy type of your characters, you know, mm -hmm. that type of, but, the anim but the animation is not that great yet. It's still a little uh, hexagonal, you know what I mean? It's still a little blocky. And so, but, but I thought it was interesting because again, I just want, I, I put this in here because I wanted to have a conversation with you about it, Will, and maybe the audience listens in and just give us feedback. Uh, by the way, go to thisweekinsales.com to leave us some feedback as well. And I wanted to have this conversation with you because this is a lot of, you know, animation. And I'm thinking a lot of programming. And I'm going, can this work? I mean, I'm trying to be objective. I believe that you got to be, you know, again, very specific in your training, as we talked about already with the LMS systems. But can this work? Well, can, you know, Creating characters work. So there's two things here. One I think you'll find really interesting, and uh, the other one will be obvious to you and some of the audience. I'll, I'll start with the least interesting thing. Remind me to come back to Adobe in case I go mm -hmm. off on a rant here. But it's I, I feel stuff like this is very much, if you put shit in, you're going to get shit out. It's not mm -hmm. to do the animation. <clears throat> it's not to do with um, for the audience who are... Uh, listening to this rather than watching it, you're basically having a conversation like you would in a Final Fantasy game or an old school role-playing RPG where you click something and there's a, there's a decision tree and the it's not even AI, it's just a, a list of yes, no, yes, no, yes, mm -hmm. no, or one zeros, and you end up somewhere else. So if you've got really talented people putting content that is relevant into this for your organization, for your product, it's coming from phone calls that are really happening as opposed to people's thoughts and opinions on things, then this could be great, and it could really ramp up uh, the the speed to, I'd say, probably ramp up the speed to get average as opposed to the speed to get exceptional at sales. I think a lot of uh, people who are exceptional at sales, it's experience, it's, it's the subtle things that you can't do in a, in a simulation like this. Right. Um, so it's, that's kind of point one. Point two, on the animation front, Adobe has a product where you can sit in front of your webcam and you can just speak into the webcam and it will animate a character based on your movements. Um, so you have you can use it with a voice actor to get it one for one, or you could have a physical actor do it, get all the animation nailed in real time, and then have a voice actor come over and do uh, the voice acting no. over the top of it. So the actual production of all this. What's that called? The Adobe, uh, it's an is Adobe it, product. The... Um, Adobe That's a really even I want to look into that. So I, I will. I love to do it but, for our. Yeah. Um, so it says oh, we have these characters. Uh, this is the only background I have in the studio that didn't have them on, and I wanted to do these animations because you can bash them out super quick. Um, yeah. But it, it was a bit cheesy and corny when I tried to do it. And looking at this website here, it does look a little bit cheesy and corny as well. So there's an element yeah. to art of some of this as well to make it look good. You you need you need a director. You need a director of photography. to you're aligning a camera in a virtual space. But lighting and all this kind of stuff, 
if you don't have that, it looks like a B film from the '90s that was filmed on some crappy camera. So that's. Uh, by the way, and I'm not criticizing the the, the, the company because maybe it has its role in the market. But I'm like, look, I think of like uh, what's the what's the big game right now? Fortnite. I'm out of mm -hmm. it. My son would probably know. So Fortnite. I mean, how many years it took? Like two, three years, four years to develop that. Red Dead Redemption took another four or five years. These are games that took four or five years. And when you're in there, you're in there, and all the options are in front of you, right? You can buy all these skins. You can buy all this armament. You can negotiate this. It's all in there. It's not, as you say, rule based. If you do A, they'll B. It's it's very dynamic. And how do you get that that dy dynamism, that dy those dynamics into a sales training, where you don't know what the person's going to say as they're playing the game, right? The simulation, and then. The, the system has all the answers already pre-programmed, so it'll respond whichever way. In other words, like a video game. I don't think I use I use video games like like again like Fortnite, and I look at these simulators and I go, "There's a mismatch. They're not there yet." So I will tell you why. There's there's a very simple reason between the <laughs> quite cheesy nature of this training and, for example, Red Dead Redemption. So. Again, this training might be great. I've no idea. I've not, I've not uh, mm. used it myself, but it does look cheesy. I'm going to say that. I'll go on the record with that. So Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption cost between 80 million and 100 million to make. It had 6,442 6, employees working on it for seven years. Seven years. This is what we're talking about. How do you... Yeah, uh, yeah you get it. But you it generated it. over 725 million in sales in its opening weekend. Look at that. Opening weekend. It's made by the same organization, uh, Rockstar, that make Grand Theft Auto. It's, I, think, I think it might still be the biggest launch. It did over a billion dollars in revenue in a weekend, Victor. So that's the wow. difference. That is the difference. Right. You, can, yeah. you can hire 100 voice actors, uh, voice artists and, and real actors in, and have them in studio and do motion capture if there's enough money and revenue on the back of it. I don't yeah. think how effective it is it's no company is going to do a billion from from sales training that you know via this method alone it would have to take over you know i think the sales training industry is a 2.2 billion dollar industry in total is that big wow that's big what if what if i'm going to paint a scenario dear salesforce watson listen up what if you took that type of resources and money and invested in creating a simulation that really helps your salespeople sell their products more effectively in the market. And that total will probably be at least half of $500 million in the next couple of years. Maybe that'd be worth it. It, it would require a very large company with a, like even a Cisco. Think about a Cisco with the extensive product lines that they have. Imagine them investing that type of money so their salespeople can sell more effectively, like in real time. It Maybe we've it. just answered our own question, Victor. Maybe some of these calculations have been done and the ROI of good in-person sales, having you, Victor Antonio come in and, and build a training plan for them, maybe the ROI of doing a simulation that is used in-house, perhaps in the future could be spun off as a separate product. Maybe the ROI just isn't there between them. I think you're right. I think you're right. I'm just hypothetically dreaming a bit, if you don't <laughs> mind. Do you know? I would love it. Stuff like that. So the tool that I was talking about before is called Adobe Character Animation. I'll link it in the show notes as well. And um, just on the homepage, you can see a demo here. And it does, I think, from shoulder length onwards. And it'll even animate your eyebrows, your facial expression. And you've got to have a illustrator and a graphic artist build a character that you animate. There's some included within it. Uh, but obviously, you want, to, you want to build your own IP. You want to build your own brand content. Um, mm, but it works. It works it. amazingly well. Loads of cartoons and children's um, TV shows on YouTube and now on Netflix are done in a very similar manner. You can tell the difference though between the more amateur ones and again the more professional ones and the bigger ones because again it's down to having a DOP, director of photography. It's lighting. It's all these subtle mm -hmm. things that you still need a, a, a film crew, even if it's virtually, to come in and, and help out with. So. Uh, I think yeah, we do. Uh, we think, yeah, we do a lot of videos, so we we appreciate those things. Like we have the eye for catching. That looks that's amateurish. That doesn't work. So yeah, I can see that. I can see. Well, that. the audience will laugh the head off. I can't move the camera to show them, but you'd laugh as well, Victor. So I have massive issues, right? So these are real screens. This isn't a uh, a green screen behind me. Just to emphasize some of this, right? I get massive issues with the reflections of the lights above me going on the screens. I've had this for three years now. I've never come up with a solution. 
And I came up with a solution this morning, Victor. Do you want to know this high-tech solution for solving this issue? No. What is it? I just got some cardboard boxes from Amazon that were in the hallway, and I've just taped them to the edge of the lights so it now reflects so down. <laughs> like, so, you, but so you put the, it barn doors on them, basically, yeah, like the old but, barn doors they had. But the, the, the massive lighting. boxes, that, uh, and they've done the job, other than the lights that they're attached to are quite warm, and so the glue is melting. So at some point, you might see a piece of cardboard fall off uh, behind <laughs> me or hit me on the head. I need a, I need a better way of, of attaching them. But the, the point of that tale was that someone who has experienced the difference between a, an, an average salesperson and someone who's exceptional, the difference between someone who can use some kind of training tool and someone who goes out into the marketplace after doing the training tool and has seen lots of issues and has experienced it firsthand and, and overcome things themselves. Someone who's works in film and production would have said, do this three years ago. And it would have been the first thing on their radar. It took right. me a brainwave and I was really proud of it this morning. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, that's a genius idea. Well, well done for that one. So that's the difference I feel with, with some of this. You just need, some of it is just real experience. I love that. The fact that you had to go through that whole story <laughs> Just to say, Will's a genius. That's what I love about this. <laughs> well, <laughs> th this is the, the number one um, largest oh, yeah. egoed hosted show on the internet, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. We're running out of time oh, here, mate. So let me okay, just go bash through this last one and um, we'll, we'll see all if we can right, fit right. in another one for me. Because this was, this is, again, an incredible article. There's tons of value mm. in this one. This is uh, from Forrester. Surprising changes ahead for B2B sellers. So this, uh, I'm going to quote a lot here, and this is Murray uh, She or Shea, who's a principal analyst over at Forrester. So again, quote, I'm calling 2020 the year that B2B sales and marketing and buying has changed forever. So there's four main areas to this article itself. So I'll, I'll just, I'll, let me rattle through them all, Victor, and mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll dump the information and we come back to it and, yep. and dissect it. So out of these four main areas, Shea believes that technology is going to increasingly take mundane, ta mundane tasks off salespeople and give them better insights to offer, uh, to be more consultative, to spend time doing the things that matter in the sales process. B2B sellers, Shay says, are going to become experts at creating and engaging with video. So historically, quote, historically, you would look for a salesperson who's a great community, a great communicator who can speak in, in language without making mistakes like I'm doing, a great problem solver, someone who can overcome objections and kick open that door and close the deal. I'm not saying, again, quoting Shay here, I'm not saying that those things aren't important anymore, but they're lower on the scale. What organizations need to hire and train for are people who are digitally adept and creative, like mm -hmm. our salesperson. And it, she goes off to describe this individual. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of points here, Victor, but is there anything mm -hmm. you want to add to that? Because this is basically what we've been talking about for nine weeks now, right? And it's interesting that Forrester, uh, and I, I can quote someone from Forrester, a principal analyst, is basically saying the same thing that we're saying. Yeah. I mean, the so there are four points here. The first was AI and automation put sellers on the path to fulfill their consultative destiny. I mean, that was drama right there. I thought I loved that. So she believes technology will remove the mundane tasks. B2B sellers become experts at engaging with video. But the next one I thought was interesting. The, the, by the way, I'm agreeing with you on both there. The B2B sales leaders activate more employees on behalf of commercial goals. Quote, unquote, the lone wolf seller, referring to the challenger sale. The lone wolf seller is facing extinction, uh, she proclaims. As buy side teams increase in size, expectations, expertise, we also need the selling teams to increase so they have breath and depth. That, that's the big one right there to me. That because some of these deals, I mean, the, the lone wolves are going to exist in, I'll just say, the small to mid-sized markets, maybe. But as you move up the enterprise complex sale, she's absolutely right. She's totally right. So I love that. And I would consider myself a lone wolf in that, not mm. that I don't work well with other people, mm. but I like to have control of things. I like things to be done uh, certain ways. I, I feel like I'm quite entrepreneurial in the way I sell in that if something is stupid and it's it's only been done because it's been done all the way in, in history previously, I'll always try and, maybe it's me just being lazy, I'll try and reverse engineer a better way of doing things. Mm -hmm. But that inadvertently then makes me somewhat of a lone wolf or, uh, you know, otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, other people call it perhaps an entrepreneurial salesperson. But having said that, in the last organization I worked at, there was me as a, I guess, kind of seniorish individual within the team. I had a an assistant, so a graduate, who would do a lot of this grunt work for me, like dropping off cameras and, and going back and forth. I had a very nice chap, uh, an older gentleman who was logistics, who would organize uh, these camera systems that I was selling. He would do all the logistics, whether he would physically drive it around or whether he'd get it loaded from the office down south and, and get it shipped up to me and all this kind of stuff. 
And so it was almost a little silo that we were working in. We didn't really have any help from marketing. That's probably only the, the only other thing that needed to be added to that mix. And that becomes then, I, I prefer it being who I am, having, being at the top of uh, you know a little food chain so that, again, I can pass things on and get things done as opposed to the bureaucracy mm -hmm. of if everyone's on, if everyone's flat within this structure of having to ask permission or get people's opinions on oh, things. Yeah. Um, so it's I feel tough. like that 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 structured silo is definitely the future of all this. Just to reiterate um, what Mary uh, Mary Shea is saying here. Yeah, and I like that fourth point she made. Our research shows that about what is forty one percent a B two B organization have reduced the size of their sales organization as a result of COVID economic hardships. Boom. Feel the thud on that one. Feel the thud. Because it's like, that's a big number. That's a huge number. That's kind of a depressing number. If you think about it. That's It'd be interesting big. to I, know the data on the, the back end of that, Victor, of our organizations just letting go of poor salespeople and using COVID and an economic downturn as an excuse to let go of them, which is, you know, that happened very much so in the last financial mm -hmm. crisis in 2008. The people just let people go. It was an excuse oh, to yeah. get rid of people, right? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Or is it that... Technology's changed, working from home, can't get in front of buyers. And so the, the whole dynamic has shifted, which has forced uh, sales organizations to, to, to change things. Yeah, I think they said, okay, let's get rid of the shitty people. That's an excuse, <laughs> right? Let's be so blunt. Let's get rid of the shitty people. Now, all right, let's see what I got. Now, those of you who are left, here's what I want to know. Which ones are you willing to learn technology? Which ones are not willing to learn technology? Those who are not, I'll figure you out. You're gone too. Ah, cream of the crop is what I have now, you know, so I think that's what's actually happening. But I want to, in, in, you know, in respecting time here, what I want to do is I want to jump to this one. Let's go culture for a second. Can I jump to culture? We can. Because move. I thought, I think it's big. PayPal is one of the first major companies to pay its workers as soon as it's earned rather than having them wait every two weeks. The move came after looking at the compensation and spending habits of its lowest paid workers many of whom were living paycheck to paycheck and rely on expensive borrowing. The idea of getting paid daily rather than weekly has grown in popularity in recent years. Uh, I, I had never heard of this. Have you? Nope. Um, I have some probably controversial thoughts on this, um, but okay. is there anything you want to add before I jump in? Rip into it. I, so I like the idea. I am defending the idea. I okay. am taking that <laughs> position. You go, Will. What do you got? So, so this is a sweeping statement, and clearly not everyone is going to fall into these brackets. And, and clearly, we're talking to a mostly affluent sales audience here, right? So, I'm talking perhaps to our audience who would consider going for daily payments as opposed to monthly or weekly, um, as opposed to I don't I don't know how much of uh, PayPal staff are kind of minimum wage and people who are struggling. So, just a prerequisite this. But if you can't manage your finances to be able to pay your bills once a month as opposed to do it daily then the issue isn't the issue isn't solved by getting paid daily it's by saving a little bit of money and again i know i appreciate i'm massively over uh, oversimplifying no. here um but i feel like uh, for our audience specifically i don't think this is uh, i think this is if you're struggling to pay your bills and you you need a payment today to to pay for something and you're in b2b sales and you you hopefully you listen to this show so you hopefully you, you you're doing somewhat well um you, you're doing something wrong that that's the, yeah. the, the the sweeping generalization of a statement that i was going to make uh, by the way when i initially read this i said i like this idea and you know i had that tv show life or debt where this is what yep. i dealt with all the time right yep. and when i saw this i go i don't know if i like this idea because first of all the administrative nightmare of this if you're on sales and you're getting commissions and what about people who return material right or cancel deals how does that work and then the administrative hassle of this is is not good i would have just split the difference as you know what let's do it every week sure let's do it every week and maybe that'd be something different and one of the things i want to i want to shift again one more time on culture i am watching the crown <laughs> i love the crown i think it's season four of the crown and you know why I like watching The Crown? Because it helps me understand you what are better. You know what I mean? I, I will. I, I think about you. I go, okay, that's how Will would say something. Like, can you say something like, let's bash this soft. Or what did you say? You used the word bash a lot today. That was your Probably. word for today. Yeah, I'm just picking up on your words. And I go, why does he use that word? But anyway, The Crown, kidding aside, The Crown is a great uh, series on Netflix. Go Netflix. I love this show. It gives you insight into the, the royal family. 
you know, that many people don't have. Do you watch it, Will? Because that's no. the true litmus my test. My girlfriend, Damn Victor. It. <laughs> my girlfriend <laughs> loves... My, sorry, this sounds like... It, uh, I'm joking here. My girlfriend bought Netflix a couple of weeks ago because the new season is coming out. She absolutely loves it. I've never watched it. To, to be fair, I've never watched it, but I, I don't not like the royal family I don't like them either. I just, think, I just think it's just a tourist attraction. It doesn't mean anything. It's just pompous, you know, pompousness. But there's lots of people in England, in Britain, who take it all way, way too seriously. There's many people I've spoken to who are physically angry that they get animated when you talk about the fact that Prince Harry is no longer a prince. He's left the royal family. Who cares, man? Like the, <laughs> the show might be great. You can have it. You can build a great drama about anything, right? If the, if the, if the uh, yeah. production and the drama is great, but the, the topic, I've just got no interest in the royal family. I'll be honest. Oh, yeah. When I, I've got a family in the states or in Chicago, Chicago area, and they care more about the royal family than what I do. They're, they're super interested in everything that's going on. I, I I think it's I think it's interesting because. They delve into certain things. Like, for example, uh, one of the last episodes I saw was the war in the Falklands with Argentina. And I didn't understand some of the background. Uh, and there's some things in there that they throw. You go, oh, I didn't know that. So that's the story behind the story. So it's yeah. not just about the royal family. You also get some historical perspective. Uh, we're in the period of Margaret Thatcher now. The, was it the Iron Lady, you guys called mm -hmm. her? So, you know, we're in that period right now. And some of that. So, anyway, I, you know, it has nothing to do with sales, but it has everything to do when you're not out there selling and you're tired and you need something to watch. Boom, the crown. That's how I tied into sales. I'll tell you what I'm watching at the moment. Um, it's a bit weird. Uh, wow, it's something about singing with wolves. Not surprising. Dancing with wolves. Uh, like, not surprising. With wolves. He just uh, said, this is what I'm watching. It sounds weird. Yeah, not surprising. What is Will watching? It's a what futuristic show. I'll tell you the premise as I try and also Google what it's called. Uh, I'll type, I'm typing wolves necromancer. Um, again, okay, raised that, that by right wolves. There. Wolf's Necromancer. So this is what is this one of those uh, Kate Beckinsmith or Smith or what are those? Kate uh, Beckinsale. No. So it's it's uh, it, I've not got far enough to explain what the Necromancer is in it yet. It's a futuristic sci-fi show where two robots land on a planet, and one of the robots they've got these humans in little bubbles. And one of the robots wires herself up and they bring up these kids and they're basically trying to restart a civilization somewhere else. And what's really interesting about it, and I absolutely love it, it's all about uh, politics, it's all about religion, and it's all the consequences of all these things projected a thousand years or whatever it is into the future. And they meet, uh, I don't want to spoil it too much, in case you're going to watch it or any of the audience is going to watch it. I'm going to look it up. What's the title again? What was the title called? again? Raised by Wolves. Raised by wolves. Okay. And it's it's uh, uh, what's his name Ripley Scott uh, who did Alien, directing it and uh, producing it. So it's you know right. it's not a low budget affair. It's it's a legit uh, high budget uh, high production TV show. And the group of uh, robots and kids are atheists, and then they get visited by a I think it's parodying uh, a Christian like group. And I'll leave okay. it as that. But yep. there's lots of explosions, people getting killed, and. Anything with religion, politics, anything like that, especially when it projects things into the future. I love sci-fi. I find all of that really fascinating. So that's my pick of the week, uh, raised by By wolves. the way, at this point, the audience listening to this understands who we are <laughs> and who has, who has more class in this conversation. I'm over here watching The Crown, something highbrow. Do you know what I mean? And you're watching Raised by Wolves. I'm just I'm saying. watching sophisticated sci-fi, politics, religion, um, your future pacing reality. You're watching Netflix trash that my girlfriend likes watching when she's just coming from a night shift. Did you just sit and binge watch it? So I'll, I'll, take that, I'll take that for what it is, Victor. All right, all right, man. Let's wrap this up, Will. Good man. Well, right. With that, uh, Victor mentioned it earlier on. If you've got any tips for us, if there's anything you want us to cover, if you want to give us any feedback, both good and bad, head over to thisweekinsales.com. There's a form on there. It just drops an email into my inbox, or you can email me or Victor or contact us on LinkedIn. The show notes, everything that we talked about will be available, hopefully, in a link below this video or podcast that you're watching or listening. And with that, I'm Will Barron, and that is Victor Antonio, and we'll speak with you again on This Week in Sales.